Sister Serena. What's up, family? How we doing? Yes. So good to be back. All right, y'all. I'm ready. Are y'all ready? Who's got their Bibles? Before we sit down, who's got their Bibles? Who's got their Bibles? You ready? Pull them out. Pull your phones out. Digital Bibles. All kinds of Bibles. Pull them out. Here we go. Here we go. Let's say it like we mean it. This is my Bible. I am what it, I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of God. I fully confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I'm about to receive the indestructible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the word of God. I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Give somebody a Bible high five as you sit down. Let's go. Whoo, L-Y-A. Y'all came red day. It's so good to, to be with you guys. Hey, raise your hand if it's your first time. We haven't met. My name is Serena. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm the young adult pastor here, and we're so happy that you're here. Hope you're already having a good time. Love seeing our squad wars happen. I don't know which team's going to win, but you can shout your team out if you think you're going to win. <laughs> well, we're going to get straight into it. You know, this month we've been talking a little bit about identity. And uh, I know that many of you had a chance to hear from our youth pastors and our Spanish youth and young adult pastor, Pastor Allen, last week, who brought it, and Pastor Devante. And so we've been touching on this subject all month long. So if you ever miss a message or you miss, a, you know, a Thursday, you can always just check us out on, on YouTube. Also, shout out to all of those. We have people who watch from all over the world. Shout out to you. Thank you for tuning in and watching. I want to focus today on two questions. Who am I? And why am I here? <laughs> you know, from the, from the moment that we're born to the very end of our lives, this is the reoccurring question that we all ask, right? We all want to know about our identity, our security, about our significance, about our impact in this world. And so... That's really the title of the message. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn, if you will, with me to Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to start at verse 53. Now I realize this is not really the most ideal passage that if you've ever heard a message on identity or purpose. But this is what stood out to me. So I said, okay, here we go, Jesus. So y'all ready? Verse 53 says, when Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue. And they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and the miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? Aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters here with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is without honor except in his own town and in his own home. And he did not do any miracles there because of their lack of faith. Whew. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for... Just today, God, just thank you for, for having us here today. God, thank you for waking us up. Thank you for just life. And before we ask anything of you, we just thank you for who you are, God. I thank you for your word that's alive and active. God, I thank you that your word never returns void. So tonight, God, I pray that we would hear what we need to hear, God, from you and you alone. I pray that by the end of tonight, God, that we would have a greater understanding of who we are and why you put us here. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, 
Amen. All right, so in this passage that we just read, you, we, we read that Jesus is in his hometown of Nazareth, right? Now, a little bit about Nazareth. Well, I guess there's really not a whole lot about Nazareth. This is a small town. There's really not a whole lot to know about Nazareth. No one, uh, no one really wealthy lived there. No one prestigious other than Jesus came from Nazareth. But this is the place that Mary and Joseph, Jesus' earthly parents, decided to raise him. This was after they fled from Bethlehem, um, not by choice. And, And just, we'll touch on this in a second, but Nazareth was about 31 hours away from Bethlehem if you were to walk or take a donkey. We'll come back to that, but... What I want us to take, a note, take notice to is the response of the people in Nazareth. So we're going to start back up at verse 54. Now, y'all, if you know me, you know I like to read this because I'm like, the Bible's full of characters, man. So coming to his hometown, he began teaching the Bible in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Hold on, isn't this the carpenter's son? I don't know, hold on. Isn't his mama named Mary? Ain't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? They're from Texas. (laughs) Aren't his sisters with us? Hold on. (laughs) So where did this man get all of these things? And they took offense. At him. So talk about hot and then cold, right? Not on Jesus, but on you. Not you, but you know, the people here, right? So one moment they're all about Jesus, the next moment they're questioning him. Somebody say, faith check. So in our human faith journey, we all go through questions, highs, lows. It's normal. We wonder, we ask questions, we discover God's plan through reading the word, worship, prayer. We process, we trust, recycle, repeat. We ask questions, this section, we ask questions, discover God's plan, process, trust. We ask questions. Discover God's plan, process, trust. One more time, we ask. Discover God's plan, Thank you. No, we're good, we're good, we're good, we're good, we're good. We're good. <laughs> but catch this. In our processing, the danger is when we allow the natural questions to overshadow the supernatural evidence of God. So example, you experience a miraculous moment in your life. God worked something out, and it was that one thing that maybe only you and him knew about. You were on your room on the floor crying praying believing for that thing and God shows up and then three months later you feel lost again it's become hard to remember the awe of God what's happening God like why did God encounters become such a distant memory When did our feelings become so fickle? I promise we're going to talk about identity. We're talking about it right now, so hang with me, okay? (laughs) So the red flag comes when the, the natural questioning overshadows the supernatural evidence. What were the questions? Like, where did he get his wisdom and power? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Yes, yes, yes. But all of these things led them to what? What comes and fills their hearts? I find it so interesting when I read the scripture that of all the things that could take root in their heart, aside from faith, obviously, because they had just seen Jesus do miraculous works 
and, and speak with such wisdom of all the things. I mean, it could have been, I don't know, doubt. Like, I, I don't know about this. I mean, this seems too good to be true. It could have been insecurity. Like, I know Jesus. I played with him. I grew up with him. Why does he get the power and I don't get the power? But of all the things, what filled their heart? Offense. Why? Offense is an ugly thing. And, and, and if, if we're honest, I know that we've all experienced it. Maybe on the giving end, maybe on the receiving end. But the thing about offense is this, is that the only person that it will negatively affect is you. Because when you don't know who you are, you begin to blame others for your shortcomings. Are we having a grown-up talk tonight? Is that okay? Yeah. Talk about it. So this is what we're seeing in our nation today, right? So we, we see political propaganda. You know, we, we don't even know who, what we're voting for anymore. I mean, it's kind of confusing, the blurred lines. One party is against the other party, and this party's doing it. Who knows that we're facing an identity crisis, right, where we hear, well, I identify as this. And I'm not even going to get into all of that. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and say this because I believe this is from God for you. If you are in the middle of that place and you're wondering, I don't know who I am or this is who I identify as, I just want to say I'm so glad that you're here. Because let me tell you this, there's no one that is greater in this room than you. I think we're all trying to chase after one thing, and that is to chase after Jesus. So my prayer for you tonight is that you would identify as a follower of Jesus. Christians against Christians. Well, well they should be talking about this. This is the house of God. Blasting each other. There isn't enough of this. When did we become God? When, when did we have the best answer and the best solution? When, who did, who, when did we think that, that, that God couldn't move in any in whatever situation where two or three are gathered? I sometimes wonder... If we've read Romans 12, 4 to 5, it says, Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Somebody say, I'm a member of God's plan, and I've got a part to play. So now you see here these people, the people from Nazareth, they're sitting inside the synagogue. They are listening to Jesus. They're in the presence of the Savior of all mankind. They had first class access to hear him, his power, his teachings, and man, they missed it. What I would do to be a fly in that synagogue you know, the, the Bible, it, it doesn't really give us all the reasons uh, of why they acted the way that they did. But I, so I don't really fully want to negate what it was that they thought that they knew and who they thought that they knew. You have to understand Jesus grew up with these people. Well, at least from what historians could find, he was in Nazareth technically till 12 years old. From 12 to 30 there's no history record of where he was. He started his ministry at 30. But Mary and Joseph, they fled Bethlehem because they had to. At the time, I'm, I know many of you know the story. The King Herod found out about this child king that was born. And so he was insecure and thought this child king is going to overtake my throne. And so he ordered a decree. And that was to execute all the male children to and under within the vicinity of Bethlehem. Now, y'all do remember what I said earlier that Nazareth was about 31 hours via walking or donkey from 
Bethlehem, which would mean that it would be in the surrounding areas of Bethlehem. George and I just took a trip these last few weeks, and we were in Rome last week. And uh, we had the opportunity to go to the Vatican City. And while we were there, we walked through their museums before we saw the beautiful chapels. And um, in one specific area, there was a hall that had AC control. And I was so grateful for that AC because it was hot. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I walked into this hall. In fact, the, the hall is called the, the Hall of, of Tapestry. And it's a bunch of beautiful tapestry from the 1500s. And it had to be climate controlled because the fabric would deteriorate in hot conditions. And so... I stood in front of this one particular tapestry, and I couldn't get my eyes off of this one because all of them uh, depicted different series and stages of Jesus' life. But this one, which I do believe we have a picture of, it is a little bit graphic, but I'm going to show it to you. And I don't know if you can fully see everything that is happening here, but this one was called The Massacre of the Innocents. And this is when... Herod decreed for all of the male children to and under to be killed. And so I began to think, man, who knows with, the, with, with the, the nearness of Nazareth to Bethlehem, who knows what news spread about this Jesus kid? Who, who knows? I mean, can you imagine what these mothers and fathers must have experienced. They saw their own children taken from them and killed before their very eyes, the ones that they provided for, cared for, carried, loved, snatched, and killed. See, to the people in Nazareth, he was Joseph, the carpenter's son. But maybe to the older generation, he could have been associated with the pain that they experienced when their child was killed as a result of Jesus being born. They had questions, I'm sure. You don't have to show it anymore, but I wonder what they felt. You know, to them, maybe this, this Jesus was associated to the pain that their family experienced. Maybe that's why it was so hard for them to embrace this Jesus in their own hometown. And sometimes I think we tend to do the same thing, don't we? Like oftentimes we identify as our pain, the pain that we experience. So if I were to ask you the question, say, hey, you know what, how, how are you doing? What do you identify as? How are you feeling? Would you say I, I'm, I'm broken? I'm hurting, I'm confused. Young adults, the only person responsible for your state of being is you. God has given us this beautiful free will to accept him or to not accept him. He's given us this beautiful responsibility to grow, and that's on you and I. So as you listen, as you ask all the questions, do it, sure. But as believers, don't be so fickle in our faith. You know, we got to ask ourselves, who am I? A am I a person of faith or am I not? Right? Do I believe that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives inside of me or does he not? And so these people, they failed to recognize who was standing right in front of them. After they witnessed the wisdom, the power, the everything. Because they were so focused on how he got there. And as a result, they missed out on their biggest blessing. But you see, Jesus knew who he was. Right? His identity didn't change because he knew who his father was. So if you're taking notes, and I hope that you have been, you can write this down. My identity doesn't change when I know who my father is. 
See, to the people, even in his own hometown, he was not known. He might have even been the oddball. Some of you can relate. You know what that's like at home. Well, why do you go to church so much? Why do you go to that place in his own city? Isn't that the same kid who used to pick his nose and then come play with splinters in his hands? I don't know. I'm just saying Jesus was a carpenter's son. I'm guessing he played with wooden things. Maybe for you in your own city. Isn't that John? That was John. He used to run at them clubs. Isn't that Alexis? She used to be out here in the streets. (laughs) Not anymore. See, people will label you based off of your history. But God redeems your history. He, in fact, rewrites your history. The Bible talks about how we're made in the image of Christ Jesus. You know what that means? Do you look like him? Do you talk like him? Do you make decisions like him? Do you know your neighbor? (laughs) Do you know your neighbor's name? (laughs) Do you know how to pray for them? Do, do, Do you know what their needs are? Am I the same person at home? I ask myself this question. Am I the same person at home than I am here in this place? Am I the same person at work than I am here in a faith-filled environment? Do I look like Jesus when no one else is around? These are the questions we need to ask. Do I see people, stop them, love them, even when I'm on vacation? My life is a mission field when I know my identity. Because as a young adult, this is a pivotal stage in your life. And if you can answer that first question... Who am I in Christ? Who am I everywhere that I go? Then you can answer the next, which is when I know who I am, I know why I'm here. The dilemma comes when we try to answer the why am I here part first, right? Like when you know who you are, then you've discovered your identity. When you discover your identity, then you realize that your identity is actually attached to your purpose. And so... The problem is we've got a whole world that is out there. I've been guilty of this too, right? And I first asked the question, why am I here? What do I want to do in this world? (laughs) And, And we start chasing after the visions and the dreams and the goals and the things, and which are all good things, but we don't go after the one who created for us to chase after those things first. Chase after Jesus. Chase after the creator, not after the created things. Do you love Jesus more than you want that record deal? Talk about it. Thank you. <laughs> do, you do you want Jesus more than that contract or that job? Do you want Jesus more than that ideal relationship? Do you want Jesus more than all the money that the world can offer? Okay, last thought, and then we're done. Somebody say, when I know who I am, I will know why I'm here. Do you know that your faith is attached to literal miracles? My faith, yes, 100,000%. Stop questioning everything and just believe. I love that our pastor always quotes this out of Mark 9. He says, when you believe, all things are possible. When you believe. And so we're going to go back real quick, guys. Matthew 13, verse 58. The last verse, chapter 13. It says, and he did not do any miracles there because of their lack of faith. Would you stand to your feet? Your faith, young adults, is attached to miracles. Yours, yours alone. I don't know about you, LYA, young adults. I just, can I just, like, have a moment and talk to you? I don't want us to be a group of young adults 
who lacked the faith that was needed to create the change that is necessary in our city. I don't, I don't want my personal faith to be like that. I, I, I don't want us to just gather here. I mean, this is great. I love Thursday nights, right? But I don't want this to just be a cute ministry where we gather and we have great times and we, but I, I truly believe, and I say this with my whole heart, I believe that the church is the vehicle to create change in this world. And guess who the church is? You. I believe that this can be a place where, yes, you bring your friends and your friends bring your friends. And, and God is here in our midst. But we don't just keep it here. We take it out to everywhere that we go. I believe that this can be a place where we see real talk. I want to see our campuses transformed and changed because a group of individuals who identify as followers of Jesus are in that place. So U of H, U of H downtown, Rice, HCC, wherever. Every college campus in our city should be different because we're there. And guess what? God could have chose anybody. He could have chose anything. He could have created some sort of, I don't know, anything. <laughs> but he chose us to be his image bearers. We're the ones who are to look the most like him. We're created in his image. What a time to be living as a young adult in 2023. I want you to think about that for a moment. I'm not, I'm not trying to hype you up. or I just want you to catch some perspective. I want you to catch some heart. You could have been born in any era, but God wanted you to be a young adult in 2023 to be the most influential generation of all time, living in a time where the world is crazy, y'all. Human trafficking is a real thing, and it is out there in front of us. And God decided for you to be his image bearer in the world that's crazy. See, everyone else around is like, well, what are we going to, what is God going to do? And I believe that God is looking at us and he said, I made you in my image. What are you going to do about it? So we're going to do something. I, I just, I prayed. I said, Lord, what, how do you want to end? How do you, what do you want to do? And I heard him say, I just, I want, I want my people to have a moment with me. And maybe, I don't know, anything that, I, that was spoken. And I, I pray and believe that this was God's heart for us tonight. I want you to take a moment right where you are. To talk to your Savior. To, to maybe have a real heart to heart with him. And maybe it's just asking for forgiveness. God, I'm sorry if I, if, I, if I took this, if I didn't take this seriously. Like I was just going through the motions. I didn't realize that people's lives are at stake. I didn't realize that you wanted to choose me. To do something great for your kingdom. Forgive me. Maybe, maybe deep down inside you need to forgive yourself or someone else. 
But I got to tell you, when God looks at you, he sees someone mighty. Do you know that you have the DNA, <laughs> the DNA of the God of the universe on the inside of you? That's a pretty remarkable thing. And he's hand-selected you, hand-picked you, predestined for you to be here to do something greater than what you could do on your own. We had to do it together. 